Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics uh, that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. <coughs> but if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and then the archive is then posted onto our website. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access um, all of our recordings. We, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission, for those of you not in Nebraska, we are the state agency for libraries, so similar to a state library. So we do training and consulting and support um, and education for all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things in our Encompass Live shows that are for any type of library. Public, K-12, academic, uh, museums, historical societies, any kinds of archives, corrections, anything that's got a library, we may potentially have a topic or a show about it. Um, anything vaguely library related. <laughs> um, we, we share things that are uh, products and services that maybe we are offering through the Library Commission to our libraries, uh, cool things we think you might be interested in. Um, we bring in guest speakers from, um, from the, um, outside the Nebraska Library Commission across the state, across the country actually, talk about things they're doing at their libraries or in their organizations. Um, so um, it's quite a mishmash. Really the only criteria is that something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, something we think they might be interested in. Um, we all, um, of course have library commission staff that do sessions as well. And that's what we have today with me is Amanda Sweet. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she does a now monthly, uh, usually the last Wednesday of the month, unless there's some scheduling things that need to be adjusted, but generally keeping it to the last one of the month, um, a monthly session called Pretty Sweet Tech, um, anything technology related. So if tech is your area of expertise or your area of interest, um, definitely the, she's uh, her shows are ones you want to um, keep an eye on to sign up for. And today we are going to learn about coding languages. It's I, yeah, <laughs> I know some things about them. I know some languages-ish. Um, I've done some of those code hour things for fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I don't know if I've learned anything practical yet because I know. Yeah. Um, but which coding language, what coding language should I learn is what we'll find out today. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Amanda, to, to tell us what to learn <laughs> or how we figure out what to learn. Yeah. Is that really what we're talking about here, I think? That is a better question. Yeah. yeah. There are so many. Yeah. So there are about a million and one different coding languages <laughs> and they keep blending them together too. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a lot of work in maker spaces across the state and I kind of help people out with trying to figure out which technology tools they want to bring into the library. And one major question I always get is what coding language should I learn? And then I always ask, well, what do you want to do? And cricket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, but I've just heard that I need to learn how to code. Yeah. I've been told yeah. I need to. I've been told I need to teach the kids how to. Yeah. But that's such a vague yeah. <laughs> and broad thing, yeah. And fun fact, so I know a lot of coders, like a lot of them. <laughs> um, my brother's a software engineer. I go to the AI and data-driven innovation event on the UNL campus. And I go to, I'm involved in um, ed tech organizations and involved in a lot of like coding organizations. Mm -hmm. And like computers and public schools and different things like that. And not even the experts know exactly which language you should learn. <laughs> There's a lot of conflict. There's even a lot of conflict about what all this technology actually is. So this is kind of what we're going to go over right here. Before we start deciding which information resources and which tools to start making technology what we should actually focus on, we should probably look at how people learn skills. Mm -hmm. 
how do people actually pick up this information? And once we know that, we can find out how libraries can help. Because librarians cannot, should not, and will not learn all of this technology thoroughly, fully enough to be able to teach someone to an expert level. Oh gosh, no. That would take about be expected. No. eight million lifetimes. We're good. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good at the, you know, we'll give you a taste, we can yeah. get you started, and then we can tell you where to go to, you know, really dig into yeah. it. And, yeah. And that's what this is get all about. Get your degree about. or something. Yeah. And that's what this is all about is showing people what's out there. So what I did was put together a bunch of information resources about machine learning, chatbots and voice assistants, IO, augmented reality, virtual reality. I have one for robotics, but every library on the planet is doing something about robotics. Mm -hmm. And I've done a robotics session before, and we only have 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. look for that other session. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I chose this technology because it blends into the background. We don't pay attention to it, and yet... That's right, you don't think about what's yeah. there behind the scenes making everything work. Yeah, and this is one of my favorite quotes that I've come across when I was reading across the gamut. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable, indistinguishable from it. Mm -hmm. That's what your phone is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's just, we pick it up and it's it just, just part works. of life. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence, just part of life. The natural language processing that recommends the text that we put out there. They're just there. Mm -hmm. So how do we learn? We start off by knowing absolutely nothing. And we can't learn something if we don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. And then we move into... I kind of know about it. I don't know why I should care, but I learned a little bit about it, and now I can start troubleshooting a little. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you can start using the skill, but you have to look up a lot of things along the way, and you might hit a lot of walls. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it's just automatic. You can code in your sleep. Nice. I know. Right? And I'm sure yeah. there's things that you've learned this way that you can match and see, oh, I've done that about something. Yeah. Yes, I've yeah. learned how to do, yeah. And this definitely isn't just coding. I've, this oh, happened no, this anything. Yeah. yeah. Like, this happened when my grandma taught me how to learn embroidery. I mean, mm -hmm. that's sure. just life. But I can now detangle my thread. <laughs> <laughs> and then libraries can help people do this just by helping people gain exposure. And we can provide general information sessions and gain like the low cost tools to be able to just show people what this stuff is and would show TED Talks and different videos about this without even investing any money into it. Mm, I'm sure. Because we can't choose what to learn if people don't know what it is. If you go out in the street and ask someone, do you want to learn artificial intelligence? They will go, what is wrong with you? Go away from <laughs> <laughs> And then, so once people know what it is, then you can start providing areas of opportunity for people to practice learning that skill. How do you keep someone with a new skill in the community? You give them areas to use it. You give them a reason to practice it. And then you start getting the other members of the community together to find out how that technology actually works and then say, you know, we don't all necessarily need to know how to make this ourselves, but we can leverage it. Mm -hmm. And now we can build different areas of expertise so we can build a, a better tool and be able to communicate with technologists. And this is one of our major goals in all of this before we even start digging into the specific tools and the specific resources. Why do people care? Mm -hmm. What are people in your community actually trying to do? And are they actually trying to learn to code from scratch? And do they want to know every single little bit of syntax? Do they just want to know how the gener like generic technology works so they can apply it in different ways? Do they want to be able to communicate with technologists to outsource a project so that they don't get a poor quality or like snake oil mm -hmm. product? You got to be able to explain it to the experts yeah. by knowing just your just enough yeah. 
to know what you do and don't like or do and don't want it to do. Yeah. yeah. And do the users of this technology just want to keep themselves safe? You hear all these horror stories about artificial intelligence taking over the world or any other thing. Yeah, coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like the privacy and security things, people hacking into the little bear mm -hmm. cams for the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. Like parents would put the little teddy bears with the camera oh, yeah. as a nanny cam in their kids' rooms. Then hackers would go in and hack into the feed and then be able to see like a little front row shot of your kids in their playroom, which mm -hmm. is super, super creepy. No. Yeah. So how do we prevent that? We need to understand this new technology just to keep ourselves safe just like digital literacy and computers. Mm -hmm. So how do we start learning? I'm going to go through each one of those major different technology categories and go over some major information resources that are easy to understand by the public and also tap into the resources of the technologist. So I'll start out with this AI for all. And we're not going to spend a ton of time on each one of these individual resources because there's only so much time. But I will share these slides so you'll yep. have access to all of these yep. links and all these learning resources. Yep. Afterwards, when we do the archives of this, um, like I mentioned earlier, if there are presentations, we include them as well. So yep. you'll have all of this, all these links that you can go in and spend more of your own time exploring if you want to. So this is my one of my favorite definitions of AI. And it is simply that right here, branch of computer science that allows computers to make predictions and decisions to solve problems. Hmm. That is your baseline definition of AI. How does it do that? It needs a lot of data and information. Mm -hmm. And the reason that AI is hitting this major boom right now is because we have access to so much more information. We generate like two terabytes of information collectively in a very short time span. And now, so that feeds into that little catch-all phrase of big data. And big data is what feeds all of this technology that we're talking about right now to make it work more effectively. And now we're hitting a slew of potential problems and we're hitting a slew of potential awesomeness. <laughs> yeah. Depends on which way it goes, yeah. yes. So this one is, so AI for All is actually an organization that is doing education outreach to, as it says, unrepresented talent. Mostly they're focusing on high schools right now. Hmm. So this actually started in Stanford. So you can reach, if you are part of a high school or affiliated with a high school, you can reach out to AI for All to learn more about their summer programs and their educational programs. And then they provide curriculum that can be used as outreach for students. And that's one way that you can incorporate that for schools instead of trying to do it all on your own. Don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's a lot of things out there that, like you said, the curriculum that you can use. You don't have to create all of these classwork or this, yeah. at least, um, trainings or, or um, exercises or things. Yeah. There's somebody else who's already done this for you, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can also go into, so this one I put in here because it has an awesome chart. Oh, nice. Oh, charts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this will basically tell you is what I'm looking at actually AI? And this is kind of your little litmus test looking, looking thing to find out what you're dealing with. And this text on the screen might be a little bit too small, but it's way easier to see on your own home screen without the app. <laughs> and this also gives an awesome description about what it is and the future of AI. And it's for, it's out of MIT, so they know all. <laughs> they know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so then, these are also resources from IBM Watson, which is mm -hmm. one of the biggest terms you're going to come across in learning about AI. Their focus is on machine learning and deep learning, and there are 
resources to, for how to learn that on your own in the next slide. And then these are the, this is the resource from Google, which is one of the more popularly used resources. However, I'm also going to open up this link from the New York Times about, so there has been a slew of Google employees that have been saying, is what we're doing actually really ethical? Mm -hmm. And Google has had, for the longest time, Google's had this open door policy about employees should be able to speak up about what they believe in and they should be able to make their voice heard and be able to have an open conversation about the ethics of technology as it's growing into the future. And they started firing people. And that started to get a little sketchy. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an expose article about the story behind that. And then you look back here. And this Google's in the name, but there are other companies that are also having that problem. Amazon, they, Microsoft. They've gotten so big, I think they've gotten bigger than they know how to do things. Yeah. And they're, str they're, I mean, they're struggling and yeah. not doing so well at yeah. it. So now we have, this is where we learn. Google, Google, IBM, mm -hmm. Google. This is affiliated with Google and IBM. We are learning from companies that now have potential ethics problems. But they're also, if they also try to corner the education market, where mm -hmm. else do we learn from? Oh, well, there's lots of places out there that are not them. Yeah. Yeah. But then this is also the number one thing used in the industry right now. So we need to learn how to use this tool, but also keep in, like, take with a grain of salt their ethics policy mm -hmm. and start learning it and understanding it well enough for ourselves that we can start having that discussion within the public and on behalf of the people that are actually using it. So in terms of the actual coding language, that's actually secondary. But Python will get you where you want to go. So Python will get you into TensorFlow. Um, Google AIY is a tool that is based in Raspberry Pi. And Raspberry Pi, this version uses Python as a coding language. And so I'll organize it this way. Code.org is the easiest way to find out this is more for kids and beginners who have never seen machine learning before. It'll give you videos and animated learning options so that you can learn the basics of the concepts behind machine learning in the easiest way possible. And so this is kind of a little sample of it. The turtle's cute. <laughs> <laughs> But this is an interactive game that will help you train your own machine learning model. And it'll show you how the basics of how the data set has to be labeled in order for the machine learning system to be able to learn effectively from it. And then it will give you an idea of the sheer quantity of data that is necessary to be able to train a model that will be put out into the world. And then the end of this activity will start questioning the different applications of artificial intelligence. We can use it to sort out which fish is which, and but then can we use it to sort out which fish is happy? Oh, gosh. <laughs> which fish is angry? Which fish is out to get you? Can we use artificial intelligence for something that's subjective? It starts mm. asking those questions. And there's got to be a lot of data for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? And so this one also gives you the additional teacher resources. It's code.org, so it uses some of the hour of code. And in partnership with Microsoft. I like Microsoft. I'm okay mm -hmm. with that. It just, take it for what it is. It's a big, the big guy. It's yeah. a big company, yeah. And then this one 
when you're done with all the resources in code.org, you can shift over to Google's AIY. The AIY is, it comes with a little Raspberry Pi, and this is just a little cardboard box that acts as a speaker. Hmm. So you're basically, there's one version where you can kind of make a mini voice assistant. There's one version where you can make a, it'll be able to recognize different facial images. And this is one where it tries to tell you what it, what your mood is based on your facial expression. Ooh, that could be fun. Yeah, right. See if it knows. <laughs> yeah. And so this one gives you like a whole bunch of different projects and it'll kind of walk you through step by step for how to put it together and how to make it. And this one is, it's Python based. So this one is one of those learning by examples. And then, I think that's the kind of thing I need because I mean, I think we say, why are you wanting to learn this? Yeah. So the, what can I do with it? Not, yes, learn how to code something, learn what the code is. and. And what the commands are, that's fine, and what you what you enter. But what's the end result? Why yeah. do I like you said? Yeah. What, why do I care, and what can I do with it? Yeah. So having some sort of real world examples, I think that that for me catches my attention a lot better. Definitely. Than just yes, you have to code. Yeah. It's like cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then so these are the intermediate to advanced version. So once you know how an API works, how Raspberry Pi works and all that stuff, you can move into the more complicated stuff. So Google put together this resource for teaching. I use the term beginners loosely here, and I mm -hmm. think Google does too, because there's some background information that you need to be able to have before you can be comfortable as a beginner in this environment. And that is where, that is why I put Raspberry Pi before this. Mm -hmm. Because if you just jump straight into this, you'll feel like you're drowning. And you'll get more out of it if you already have a background in the basics of Python syntax. And that's where this comes in because there are, Python actually put together a set of resources for different ways to learn Python. And because everyone learns differently. Mm -hmm. And I can send you to the one that I use to start learning the basics, but that's not gonna help everybody. You might actually have, to, I've had, I had to go through seven different tutorials for Python before I found one that worked for me. And I so I worked through about a good number of these. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it finally just clicked. It's nice they got so many different ones from yeah. different places, yeah. yeah. And some of these are free, some of them are behind a paywall. Um, Mosh is the one that I use to learn C Sharp. Um, he's delightful. <laughs> and so here, I didn't put this into a slide, but here was what I recommend for people trying to learn a new programming language from scratch. Um, start going onto YouTube and start searching the basics of the coding language. And you'll usually be sent over to an hour to a two hour long video that will show you the ins and outs of the syntax and the different areas of the programming language. And as you start to learn more about it, then you'll start learning the keywords to look for to troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be able to find a higher quality program that is behind a paywall. And you'll know that they're covering, they're covering the topics and information that you actually need and that you are paying for something decent and it's delivered in a way that you can understand at your current experience level. Mm -hmm. And that is actually what I used this YouTube video for, is to learn enough about it to know that I'm not getting snake oil. So that's kind of your generic machine learning, start with Python. Mm -hmm. And that is just going to get you into the door. 
And then they're going to tell you that there are a million other coding languages that you can also use, like C++ or you can also use JavaScript with it. But mm -hmm. Python, start with Python. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's a good place to start. Yeah. Uh, question, what can you explain what is Raspberry Pi? Sure. That's something that some people are not sure about. So Raspberry Pi is a wee little computer. And I'll actually okay, open in in this. So Raspberry Pi 3B is the one that I have, but the most recent model is the Pi 4. And here we go. It's this actually is that, yeah, that yeah. little like yeah. sort of motherboard looking thing, but it's like yeah. Yeah, big. It's, yeah. So the heart of a computer. Pretty much. Kind of. It's got a little processor in there. It's got some USBs. It's got, uh, there's a little Wi-Fi chip on the back. And there's an Ethernet cable port. There's some charging ports. And actually, there's a whole diagram that'll show you what everything is. So people have used Raspberry Pi to build robots. They've used it to build, you can turn it into a voice assistant. Um, you can turn it into just about anything. So I'll actually go into this here. You can make a chat bot with it. <laughs> so this is Raspberry mm. Pi's project page. And a chat bot is like a little a version of artificial intelligence. So when you go to some of those bank websites and you need to ask a, mm -hmm. for help with something like that, a lot of times now you'll be sent you won't actually be interacting with a human. Mm. You might be interacting with a machine. And that machine is programmed to deal with a whole bunch of different specific subject matter questions. So if you veer off of that, it'll probably say something like, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Let me send you to an agent. Then you talk to a real human yeah. being. <laughs> yeah. But it handles simple things like depositing a check or verifying your identity hmm. and um, checking your bank balance and things like that. And there's also a, oh, there's a slew of stuff. I should do one just on Raspberry Pi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Oh, definitely. I know. Because it's so easy to get a hold of and, and get yeah. one and, yeah. and not expensive to start with. So, yeah. yeah, to have them. Actually, Raspberry Pi appears later in the Internet of Things, too. Okay, I skipped one slide here. But chatbots and voice assistants are kind of everywhere. So this one will kind of go over what chatbots are, which is basically, here, I'll open. Uh, I don't want to open. This one is a shorter one. There. Chatbot is a computer program that uses AI to have conversations with humans. So mm -hmm. this has gone also in good and bad directions. Mm -hmm. So they've used um, chatbots as like therapist replacements because they wanted to use like a low, a low cost um, therapy option. And they ran into some trouble. Mm -hmm. So there was, I let's see if I put this article in here. Okay. I didn't put that one in here, but I'll open this one. So we mm -hmm. want to know what we should look for in a good chatbot. And we want to know what, how chatbots should be applied and how they should not be applied. And can we trust the information that was provided mm -hmm. by a chatbot? And we also need to know the different types of chatbots that are out there, how they're made, and how information filtered through those chatbots can impact us. Because we're librarians. We care about where information came from. Mm -hmm. We're very skeptical. Yeah. Healthy skepticism, which is important. <laughs> yeah. And when you have a conversation with someone, you think of information differently than you would when you're reading it. 
So when you read it, mm -hmm. you have that litmus test of things that you should look for, like who wrote the article, when was it published, um, who funded it, and all this stuff. When you're interacting with a little Amazon Echo where you just talk into a cube and say, um, where is the capital of Japan? <laughs> and it just tells you. <laughs> and But then you start asking it more subjective stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, what should I do with my life? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we can get in trouble, right? <laughs> yeah. How do you ask a voice assistant when the last publication date was? Mm. I've tried it. Like, I tried both Google Home and um, Amazon Echo. And I said, give me three sources of information about this topic. Mm -hmm. And it Googled, give me three sources of information about this topic. <laughs> And didn't understand what yeah. you really I got information yeah. about digital literacy, mm -hmm. but it it didn't give me the right source. The right, yeah. And I asked, when was this article published? And it didn't didn't know how to it find didn't, that out. It couldn't access the metadata to be able to find it. It mm -hmm. wasn't. I'm sure there are some databases and some sites that will tell you if the metadata was put in correctly, but the this wasn't. It needs to be able to. It, this is the coding part. It needs to be able to know how yeah. to find that info and it has to be in there for the computer to yeah. see it. Yeah. And the reason I give you this information is not because I think you're going to memorize it all and use it all tomorrow, but it's because you can now go, you can take this new information about technology and you can go out into your community and start seeing how this is going to be impacting people and start finding out why people in different professions and why students and why different people will care. And then how can you use this to make the library a resource on technology? Because if you sit down and you ask yourself, if someone walked into the library right now and asked a bunch of information about how to get the best resource to learn about technology, can you help them? Mm -hmm. Because libraries are an information resource. Technology is now one of the most popular topics in the world. Can we help them? Some can, some can't. I can't tell you what your resources are right now, but if you feel that you're lacking in that area, this is here to help. And this is part of the huge maker movement. Yes. All of these beginner level and possibly even some of the intermediate advanced they're incredibly easy to do in a maker session. And so you start with beginner and work your way up. And you can give this as information for people to know where to go next. Because that mm -hmm. is one of the hugest problems that are in maker spaces everywhere. We want to help people. We want to give people information for how to get to the next step. Mm -hmm we don't have the time or resources to help them personally. Yeah. So start with beginner and then provide them with access to information and then get people on board to help them practice what they learn. And that's what we can do as a library community. And what is our time? <laughs> That'll tell me if I want to go in. Uh, 10.40. Okay. And I want to still go over IO. I'll open two of these sources and then we'll keep chugging along. So the Raspberry Pi chatbot we just opened recently. The Scratch chatbot is similar, but it's using a different language. Mm -hmm. And FYI, Python will help you with this too. Mm -hmm. And Google's dialogue flow is where you want to go to be able to learn more. So this is one where you don't necessarily need to have a coding background. Um, Python will help a bit, but you can get by with just using their built-in information. So on here you will find a practical use guide and a design guide. And it'll tell you how to gather the correct information to be able to build the most effective chatbot. It'll say, what are you trying to design? And 
what what is your target audience? Which subject matter are you going to be covering? Um, if you're designing a chat bot, what is your context? What are the questions that people are most likely to ask? And what will you do if your chat bot is not able to answer that question? Mm -hmm. Because I think this is good. That brings you right to starting off with what's your ultimate goal? Yeah. Not let's play around with the, the creating this thing, but what are you trying to do in the end and then yeah. back work backwards from there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just if you do one single project and don't frame it in any way, shape or form, you're just kind of not gonna connect building, to it. Yeah. You know, you're building another chat bot that will, that may potentially confuse and frustrate people. <laughs> And so we'll close that, and I'm going to close a bunch of these. Yeah. And that. So then we'll hop into Internet of Things. And this is basically the whole world is basically connected. This is what connects devices, connect different devices to the internet at large. So if you have a greenhouse and you want to be able to find out what the temperature and humidity is that will help your plants grow the best, you don't have to be sitting in your greenhouse all the time or manually check it. You can set a little alert that says the humidity is over this certain level. You Do might want to look at that. It, yeah. And then you can take it a step further, and you can integrate it with an IO-based um, thermostat so that you can trigger it so that if the humidity or temperature goes above a, above or below a certain level, the thermostat will automatically adjust itself. React. And then you can take that a step further, and you can start put, putting sensors into your soil to read the nutrient levels and find out when they actually need to be watered. Then you can take that a step further and automate it so that you can set up a sprinkler system so that if it goes below a certain temp like soil level, you can either Dry. spritz it with a nutrient mm -hmm. or you can spray it with water so that it goes up to its proper saturation point. So good things can happen in your mm -hmm. garden. <laughs> And this will kind of tell you about the different things that you can do with IO and where it's kind of going. And I won't go over this whole thing because we have oh, 20 yeah. years. Yeah. But a better way to find out what it can do is to just do it. And that is where if this, then that comes in handy. Mm -hmm. So if this, then that is exactly what it sounds like. These are kind of like a little system of different devices. Mm -hmm. um, if I wake up in the morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, set my coffee maker Thank to go you. off. Yep. And this gives a whole bunch of different options that you can do to play around with in and out of things. And this will tell you the device that you need to get to be able to play around with it. And it'll give you a step-by-step -step of how to do it, how to set it up. And basically, it's just downloading an app and then putting in some settings of a target sleep duration. And then it'll give you a little alarm that says, go to bed. You didn't get enough. <laughs> yeah. As usual, very right. to me all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want the mo like the biggest list of practical applications, go to this site. This is, they've got a lot of them there, yeah. Yeah. And things that are actually like in real life, these are things you would actually yeah. care about. Yeah. Yeah. And this is stuff you can get it and do it tomorrow. Some of them are more expensive than others. I have a love hate relationship with the vacuum robot. Roomba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but some of them are super cheap. And a lot of them actually run through Raspberry Pi or the Google mm -hmm. Assistant. This Google Assistant, I got the mini for like, I got on a Black Friday sale for like 20 bucks. Yeah, you, you can get them on sales a lot. Yeah. 
but so options. And this is also a really quick and easy way to set up a maker activity to show people how it works. And then I said that we would bring Raspberry Pi back up. So these are, this also uses IFTT, if this, then that. But it integrates it with the Pi. So this will give you kind of a wiring diagram. It'll give you a step-by-step -step for how to set that up. And some of these will have video instructions for how to do it. I don't. I'm not going to wait for it to blow to that. <laughs> like some will give video instructions for how to do it. Some are just written instructions, and some are some are better than others. It's good to have that option of the video because I know some some people are better learners watching yeah. it actually happen, um, oh. or sometimes it just helps supplement what you did read. I have that sometimes. I'm yeah. trying to fix something or do something like I want to see somebody else do it first. I can read this whole thing, but I want to make sure you know yeah what it's supposed yeah. to look like when I get to that point. <laughs> yeah, and this one has a bunch of beginner level stuff and. Some of these leaves beginner loosely. <laughs> you might actually want to start with regular Raspberry Pi projects and get used to the API and how the computer, like how the Raspberry Pi talks to an actual computer and how it interacts with sensors. So that's why I put in this. This is Arduino. Arduino is a microcontroller. It's not actually, it can't really be used as a full-fledged computer like the mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi, but you can use it to also do robotics and you can use it to learn how this microcontroller talks to a computer. And it also uses a bunch of different sensors. So that accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnometer those are the three sensors that are inside of a virtual reality headset that help you locate yourself in space. Mm -hmm. And they're also in your cell phone. So whenever mm -hmm. you tilt your phone and the screen knows to switch over to a landscape or a portrait, right. then those are in play. And then the your map system also uses that. And there's also, remember that garden stuff that I was talking about? Mm -hmm. There are also options for setting up different garden experiments using this because learning system. And this is designed for the classroom. But it can also easily be adapted into different libraries. Oh, sure. Or if you're a school library, mm -hmm. cool. So you can search by the actual sensor and it will give you different projects and it will tell you the recommended grade level and then it will also tell you a step-by-step -step of how to set this up and how to start learning it for yourself and then how to help people learn it. Mm -hmm. So Raspberry Pi is sometimes kind of a reach as a beginner step. Yeah. But this is a good entry level point so that when you're familiar with how the system works, and you've gotten the step-by-step -step informational section, then you start gaining that comfort level, and then you can start going into mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi. Yeah, once you know how it works, why all yeah. those pieces, you're putting it together yourself, all those pieces in there, you kind of understand, yeah. know, oh, that's why I put that there, and that's why I put this here. Yeah. Rather than coming up with, here's the end result that you now have to figure out. Yeah. <clears throat> here's the end product, yeah. And a lot of Raspberry Pi, they are not kind to very, very beginner coders. Mm -hmm. But this one is. Like this one will definitely walk you through and say this is why, this is what this line of code is doing. Try changing this one single number in here and then press play and find out what it's doing. See what happens. And this is a, my, one of my favorite learn by doing kind of things. Because this will, it, I don't want to say hand-holding, 
but it gives like med better description. Mm -hmm. And it gives like a perfect walkthrough in an easy to understand way and a better, easier to understand diagram. And a lot of the Raspberry Pi stuff, it's not, some of the stuff is out of date. Some of it's made by people who aren't used to writing instruction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I've, re I've read through some open source Raspberry Pi tutorials on Instructables and been like, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> but this one will help you get like ease into it. Anyway, close that. And Ubidots is another one that works with Raspberry Pi or Arduino. So do not be fooled by this opening page because there is an education system and there is a source for industry. So they'll ask you for your, if you click into this pricing section mm -hmm. and then you go down and they will ask you, are you actually looking for the STEM one? Mm -hmm. And why, yes I am. <laughs> And then it'll ask you to sign up and it'll just shoot you into that STEM section, which is free. The one for educators. Yeah. yeah. But with this, what this is actually doing is, uh, this isn't a good one. This one. Oh, I hate clowns. <laughs> So they partnered with a whole bunch of different organizations to make this system compatible. And this will, it's more of like a plug and play option for being able to download an app onto your phone and then have that app be able to collect data from a sensor that is plugged into a separate device and have that sensor communicate with your phone more easily. And that is, that's the amount of things. Yeah, connecting all those things. Yeah. And it's used in industry, and it's used in education, and it's used in lots of different ways. So you can also find more examples of how the Internet of Things is being used in the real world by going into EBITDA. And then it'll also give you better information about how to integrate this stuff and how to use it now instead of after I learn the entire coding language. Mm -hmm. So once you, like Raspberry Pi will open the door for a lot of different things. Yeah. It's everywhere. And it's been around for a while. Yeah. yeah. It has a good support system and it's mm -hmm. got integration into a lot of other different systems. And it's a, it's a techie's dream. <laughs> <laughs> and this will just give you more or less step-by-step -step instructions for how to do it and what you need before you can start doing it. And most of these sensors are remarkably cheap. So 10 bucks mm -hmm. and a $40 Raspberry Pi and an education account, mm -hmm. you're in business. It's easy. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And then it also gives you the right wiring setup. Anyway, that's why I like this one is because it's easier to understand and it doesn't force mm -hmm. you to learn everything before you can just get going. Hey, David trying to sell me something. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so since, since we are getting close to our end, I just want to remind everybody, if, if you do have any questions you want to ask Amanda about any of these things, type into the question section in your GoToWebinar interface. Yeah. Um, you know, let us know as we're going through these. Or if you have any comments or thoughts on, on any of this that you've done, if you've done anything like this. Yeah. Or if you've had anybody at your libraries ask you about doing anything like this, your experiences or anything, um, go ahead and type into the question section and we can uh, chat about that. Yeah. The real people, not a chat box. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Or is it? <laughs> yeah. And so this is where you would go into the more advanced level stuff. And so these I linked straight over to the option that will integrate with Raspberry Pi. And 
Azure is like, it'll give you a lot more flexibility of what you can do with the Internet of Things, and it'll kind of open the door for building the whole system yourself. And some people really want to do that, and other people just don't care. <laughs> but it's an option. Yeah. And Microsoft is also pretty good about building their own training system, too, because they want you to use your pro their product. Absolutely. So they want to teach you how to, yeah. how to do it. Yeah, yeah. They want you to want to use theirs. Make yeah. it easy, yeah. And that's why it's easier to find stuff for free on here, because they're hoping you'll, you'll stay with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> keep using it. Yep. And Google has the same thing. Google has, like, everything. <laughs> Google has, I mean, even though you did say, you know, things like they're having issues with being evil or whatnot, they are good with putting out educational type things, but trying yeah. to teach you how to do things, um, whether it's using their using their products and services or using other ones. They're, they have, always I think, been about that, like, yeah. We're here to help you find information, kind of like like librarians. Yeah, we're here to help yeah. you find it, um, but we're we're here to help you teach teach you how to use some of some across the board things as well. Yeah. And so augmented reality, that's just fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one is you hold up your the most popular method of it is using a mobile phone mm -hmm. because most people have one. So you open up an app on your phone, the app accesses your camera, you hold your phone over, when the camera recognizes a certain object, it will overlay a digital image or play a sound or trigger some sort of media to be able to display on the phone screen. And the best way to learn about it Uh, Pokemon Go is the most popular mm -hmm. one. So he is pointing his phone out into the beach, and there is a polywhirl. And this is what shows up on your screen when the camera recognizes. This one is geolocation-based, not mm -hmm. trigger-based. So there is marker-based and marker-list-based. Marker based uses an actual image or a target image to be able to trigger that sound or overlay onto your phone. Um, Pokemon Go uses like a GPS location so that when it read when your phone reaches that point, that's when the Pokemon pops up on your screen. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to learn more about how this stuff actually works, we have some resources on here. And this is where it's going in the future. Oh, this is going to give me an ad. So be it. So she is wearing the headset. And now she can interact with the digital objects that she's seeing on her headset. That's definitely the future. That's all. That's the kind of thing we see in the movies and the in the TV shows. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> but. So I'm going to skip to you can press interactive buttons and she is about to play a piano. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So the HoloLens 2 was made by Microsoft. It actually costs $2,500 for a developer's kit. Mm. And that's why the Learn the Basics is more of the start with a mobile phone mm -hmm. and 
don't put the money into the really expensive stuff until you know people are going to be interested in it. Yes. And the other question is, is the Hubble lens actually going to be able to get to a point where the price point is low enough that they can commercialize it? Yeah, right now, no. And so that is where AR could go, but it's also just really fun on the mobile device, too. Yeah. It's not the same after you've seen that video, though. I know. And that, <laughs> you know. that is like the epitome, the per the exactly what everyone wants to be able to do with yeah. it. And it's yeah. not, available, not easily available to people yeah. yet. So how can you do it? Um, start with the Merge Cube, which is... It's a little phone cube. And it sort of looks like a board cube. And it is integrated with a bunch of different, it has support by CoSpaces, which is an educational app. And so, honestly, this is a terrible picture, picture presenting what this is, <laughs> because it makes it look like he can just see the cube and he's seeing that. But you can't. But you can't. Show. You need to wear no. the device. So, yeah. if this were a better picture, this cube would actually be in front of the camera on this display screen, and he would be looking at the screen. And he might have a very vivid imagination, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, I should maybe write them a letter. <laughs> but no, this you can actually only see on your digital device. But you can also integrate this with Tinkercad. And Tinkercad is a free system where you can build your own 3D objects and designs. And this is automatically merged into eh, merged, merged <laughs> into the Merge Cube so that people can go in and build their own 3D design in Tinkercad, and then they can pop their image onto the Merge Cube. And the Merge Cube, I was hoping I would find a better image of it. This is it. Oh, definitely Borgish. Yeah. But so these are their anchor points so that when the camera registers those specific images, it pops that onto the cube. And there's also a VR part of this, too, but it's made out of foam. And I've tried hmm. putting different sizes of foams into it. And it's really easy to break that foam. Yeah. So if you do get this, make sure you have little Velcro strips so that you can use that to hold the phone in place because mm -hmm. that foam breaks in a hot second. And so Unity is the next version, and C Sharp is the language that you would want to learn for Unity. And then Google's AR Core is kind of the next level and AR Core actually works with Unity Game Engine. And I don't think I have time to describe Unity too terribly much because I'm already over. <laughs> okay. But it is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> and so this are, these are some places to learn C Sharp. When you learn C Sharp, it'll be easier to animate and manipulate images into Unity Game Engine. Mm. If you don't want to learn how to code, but you just want to find out how Unity works, um, Google Unity and Vuforia Game Engine, because Vuforia will let you just pull in different pre-made 3D images and pop it into a system. And these are some other areas that you can find to learn this. Mosh was just one that I preferred. Mm -hmm. And virtual reality, I have a floating dot. Mm -hmm. So virtual reality society will tell you pretty much anything and everything you need to know about virtual reality. And Basically, you can put on this headset, and it will block out any, any visuals from the world around you. You'll be immersed into a virtual world. And this is being used in a ton of different ways. Uh, da, da, da. Here. 
So these are the different industries currently using virtual reality. And these will give you different ideas of how. Uh, visualizations is one of the bigger ones. And construction is also another huge one. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Being able to, for architects or construction groups to see what it's supposed to look yeah. like before they get it wrong. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. Put the board or the whatever in the wrong place, yeah. And then if you want to make it, um, C Sharp will also get you there. Um, the same tools that are used to make augmented reality, most of them can also be used to make virtual reality, actually all of them. Um, the only different option here is A-Frame. And A-Frame uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And but honestly, if you're in, if people want to go into industry, Unity is the way to go. And I used A-Frame in a previous show on Encompass Live. That was one of the yeah. things used in a yeah. previous session that we did. So uh, I did a quick tutorial just yeah. because it's fun. <laughs> And so if you want to start integrating tech into education in the library, some awesome ways to do it are to do basic tech intro sessions using some of the beginner format tools that I put into the previous slides. I didn't click open every single one of them, but they're yep. right there for they're you going to be access. there for you to act. Yep. And you can start getting people thinking about what does this mean for privacy and security? What does this mean for us as a community? And how is this going to what do we need to know about? Mm -hmm. And then start thinking about, sure, this technology is cool, but can we actually use it? And does it matter? Practical. Yeah. There's many practical applications, yeah. It may matter in one community, but not another. And not all of these are going to be for your community, necessarily. I mean, there's a huge list of things we've got here to look yeah. into. You're going to have to see what people in your area are interested in. Yeah. yeah. And you can also do... Um, just basic access to tools, and you can do just a curated resource collection. Just pop an information session onto your page. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 you let your people go and explore these sites themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, too, about a lot of this. I think it has it's being a librarian or working at a library in general is you don't have to be an expert in anything really yeah. that your community or your users might want. You just need to know how to get them to the places where the experts are. Exactly. Um, and sometimes it's hard to, you know, in, the, in, this, in this particular topic of coding languages, where do you even start? Yeah. We've given you, the, you know, we did that work for you. Oh, yeah. Amanda, not me. <laughs> yeah. um, so now at least you have, if somebody does ask you, what about coding? Well, here, here's some things you can go and give yeah. them to do it. You, as the librarian, don't have to learn how to teach this coding. You can just find the places that will teach them. And I learned it from talking to about a million and one people. Right. She's <laughs> <people. Yeah. laughs> That's the way, too. Yeah. And so that's about the long and the short of it. I yeah. threw a lot of stuff at you. Mm -hmm. But if you find some of it interesting, then cool. Yeah. And that's about so, it. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any 11 minute? We are a little over 11 o'clock, our official end time, but that's okay. Um, anybody have any uh, desperate questions you want to ask of Amanda while we're still here wrapping up? Type it into your question section. Uh, nobody had any questions during the show. Um, but that's okay. Um, there's a, like you said, there's a lot of information we put yeah. out here for you. Yeah. The links, all of these slides and everything will be available for you afterwards so that you can just go ahead and um, check out all these resources yourself. And you can always contact Amanda here at the commission. Um, all our contact info is on our website, so you shouldn't have any trouble um, asking your questions that way. Honestly, the resource slides are probably the most important part mm -hmm. of that, which mm -hmm. I'll actually share in the chat, so you can just click it open right now. And you hit Control V. Yep. And send. So oh, there it is. Yep. So there should be a little chat in the in your and in, go to a webinar interface. One of the tabs is chat. There's a link in there you can go ahead and click on right now if you want to get to it. Um, if you don't grab it right now, it will also the same link will be included when we put up the archive recording. Um, should be available by the end of the day today. Yeah, that's my goal. <laughs> um, all right. 
So let's hop over to back to here and uh, so um, let's get to the Encompass Live website. So far in the world, I keep saying this, and it still works. Encompass Live is the only thing called that when you use your search engine of choice. Yeah. Google thing, whatever. So you'll find our website um, here. Um, as I said, we have rec been recording the show. It'll be available on our archives. This is our upcoming shows. Right underneath here is where the, our archive shows are. The most recent one at the top of the list. So right here will be um, by the end of the day today. As long as uh, go to webinar and YouTube, cooperate with me. Uh, it will be posted there uh, with a link to the recording that ends up on our YouTube channel and a link to the Google Slides of um, Amanda's will be here. Uh, all of you who attend this morning and everyone who pre-registered for today's show will get an email sent to you from me letting you know when it's available. We also push out that information on our mailing list, our Facebook page, uh, Twitter, all the usual communication devices. Yeah. <laughs> um, these are our full archives. If you want to, you can search here. As I mentioned earlier, any of our other previous shows we have around here. Our entire history of Encompass Live is here going back to January 2009 when we first started the show. So um, please do use our search feature here to, to um, do that. If you want really up-to-date information, just limit it to the most recent 12 months and you'll find really current, most recent shows. Um, but if you do, no matter what you do in here in searching, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Some of these, especially the old, much older shows, the information might no longer be correct. The websites might no longer exist. Um, services may have um, either closed down completely or changed drastically <laughs> since something we did in like 2010 or something. I just pay attention to that when you're there on the on our archives. Uh, let's get back to our main page here. There we go. All right. Um, Encompass Live does have a Facebook page. If you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We do post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Or post updates there a couple of times a week. So if you want to keep track of us and up, keep up with us on Facebook, you can like us over there. I'll hope you join us. And um, this is our upcoming shows. You see I've got a couple for March, a couple of April on here. More will be added as I'm finalizing discussions with some people about presenting. But next week's show is going to be the Healing Library. Now, responding to trauma in your community through non-traditional lending. Um, this is a, a library, the Healing Library is actually an organization that will lend out um, educational materials, downloadable materials they have for you for all sorts of trauma-related things that might have affected children in your community, adults, whatever. Um, here in Nebraska, I know we did last year had a lot of issues with um, the flooding. Yeah. Towns wipe, you know, and it was traumatizing for everyone in all ages. Yeah. So this is an organization that's doing that. Uh, Megan will be here on remotely online. I think she's in Tennessee, if I remember correctly, that's where she's based, um, to talk about that. So please do so uh, log um, join us for next week's show and your other upcoming shows as well. Um, also, one last thing I'll mention is um, just a little. Um, Big Talk from Small Libraries is coming up on Friday. This is our annual online um, conference uh, about where we have library uh, presenters from small libraries. Everyone who is a presenter on our online conference is from a library with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. So it's all a little nice. Um, this is on Friday. This is in two days. I'm I run this as well um, using our same GoToWebinar software we have here. Um, I'm just I'm getting things <laughs> finalized <laughs> for it all, so I'm a little frazzled, but um, please do join us. You can still register for it. Um, even after registration closes officially, you can still you'll be able to log in on the fly. We'll post up the login information. Um, check out our schedule. We've got presenters throughout the whole day from um, locations all across the country, a couple from Nebraska here, but from other states as well. Um, we've got five 50-minute um, sessions, and then over our noontime hour, we have lightning rounds, five, no, seven of those. Um, longer sessions, five 10 minute sessions over the uh, noontime hour, seven regular longer sessions throughout the day. Um, the whole day will also be recorded just like we do in Compass Live, so if you're unable to watch on the day, you can always go and watch it um, when we do get our recordings up in a, in a couple of weeks. But please do join us for Big Talk with Small Libraries on Friday. We'd love to have more people there. Uh, all right. so. Like we had one person here. What do we have here? Oh, just some thank yous from the audience. Cool. <laughs> All 
All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you very much for attending. Hopefully we'll see you another time on Encompass Live or on Friday for Big Talks and Small Libraries, our annual online <coughs> small library conference. Thanks. Bye-bye.